the question is, is Bitcoin a hedge against hyperinflation? I don't think so. I don't think it's a hedge against any inflation. I mean, you could say maybe it's a hedge against stupidity. I mean, if people are still stupid, they'll, maybe they'll buy it uh, or greedy. I mean, I think it's the combination of ignorance and greed that really drives the, the Bitcoin price. But the reason that gold, right, and everybody wants to compare gold to Bitcoin, even though they're, they're nothing in common. Michael, but that's, Michael calls it digital gold bars sitting in cyberspace. Michael is a professional Bitcoin shill at this point. I mean, he's all over the place. I mean, that's why I came on your podcast to kind of debunk some of the nonsense <laughs> that, he was, that he was selling on here. But look, he's trying to get people to buy what he owns. I mean, obviously, because that's the only way to get Bitcoin to go up is if somebody else buys it because you can't do anything with it. You can't use it for anything. There's no natural buyer. But this gets me into why is gold a hedge against inflation? Well, when you own gold, you own a commodity. You own a metal, right? You own the most useful, the most valuable metal in the periodic table, right? Now, inflation makes all commodity prices go up, right? So if, if, if there's a lot of inflation, wheat's going to go up, Corn's going to go up. Oil's going to go up, right? Now, am I going to buy a bunch of wheat? Am I going to buy a bunch of oil? Where am I going to put it, right? I mean, it's very hard. Even if those are the things I need. Let's say I need to use a lot of oil. I don't, let's say I don't use gold. I'm not a, a jeweler. I don't make uh, jewelry. I don't make uh, you know, semiconductors. I don't actually need gold. Uh, maybe I don't even wear jewelry. I need wheat, right, because I eat bread, or I need oil because I, I drive my car. But I'm not going to store the oil because, I mean, what, I, where am I going to put it? But if I store the gold, right, and gold goes up in price along with oil and along with wheat, I can take that gold and I can exchange it either directly or indirectly. And then I can use that to buy my wheat or my oil because there is somebody out there that needs that gold because they have to make jewelry because that's their business or they need to conduct electricity or they're making uh, crowns for dentistry, or they're doing something in aerospace or whatever it is that needs gold, right? So it's a, it's a good that can rise in value relative to other goods that is easy for me to store because I have to get out of paper, right? Oh my God, there's all this inflation. I got to get rid of my paper. How am I going to store my purchasing power? Well, over the centuries, gold has been a very convenient way to store your purchasing power because it's a real good that's very, you know, it's, you can get a lot of value in a small space. Right. Every ounce of gold is the same as every other ounce. So it's, you know, it's easy to use as a mean of exchange. Now people say, well, why can't I use Bitcoin for that? Well, Bitcoin, unlike gold, has no actual use. So there is no guarantee that anybody is going to want your, your Bitcoin in the future, even though they may want it now to speculate on it. You don't know. And there are historic relationships. I can take a look at 100-year, 1,000-year charts up there around. Gold versus wheat. Gold versus corn. Gold versus copper. Gold versus all sorts of things. To have some idea of a relationship that you can expect over time. There is no such relationship between Bitcoin and anything. I mean, nobody knows, oh, you know, what's the proper price of, of this in Bitcoin? I mean, there is none. I said to, uh, to Michael, I said, look, you know, just saying that something has uh, has interconvertibility uh, and so forth. Look at Isaac Newton. He invested in the uh, South Sea bubble, uh, which was like a real estate Ponzi scheme. He, in he invested in other things. As I said, he was very convinced that you could turn uh, base metals into gold and thereby debasing it. And, and Michael replied, well, first of all, you know, as Warren Buffett said, most of the gold ever mined, all we seem to do is dig it up and then put it underground and then have some guys with guns sitting, sitting in front of it. And whereas, you know, he, uh, he's not a big Bitcoin, you know, hodler either, Warren Buffett. But, but the point is that people pay, you know, what they think something is worth. And my question to you is, isn't this of a different character? I remember you very presciently, Peter, in the late 90s, uh, first with the dot-com bubble, and then in the early 2000s with the real estate bubble, you were very prescient. You called it. You were dead on. Peter Schiff was right. I'll link to that video sometime in the YouTube description. However, those bubbles, as they were, lasted a mere two years at maximum. If you claim, as you did in 2013, you Spencer retweeted today a tweet from you back in 2013 or something. Uh, it, it's it's cute to see you guys on, on Twitter engaging in such <laughs> fun. But anyway, he retweeted, yeah, Bitcoin's about like 61 or 100 or whatever it was. And I just want to ask you, how many bubbles from your story study as a historian of monetary um, knowledge as you are as a scholar, 
what bubble has lasted 13 years or, or more, you know, at this yeah. point and not well, pop, you and know, in fact, just gone up and, and, and survived bull and bear markets, by the way. Well, first of all, the housing bubble lasted a lot longer than that. It really got started in the mid 1990s, along with the Nasdaq bubble. So Greenspan started inflating two bubbles in stocks and real estate in the 90s. It's just that when the stock market bubble popped, the air kind of left that bubble and went into the real estate bubble. And so it kind of kept going up until 2005, you know, it really didn't blow up until 07, but it kind of peaked in 2005. So it really was about a 10 year bubble uh, with home prices going up much faster than they normally did. So it, 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 it's just that it got really crazy in those last few years, right? I mean, that's when it really went to the, to the main manic stage. So if you want to count the early years of Bitcoin when it was just like, you know, people were gambling with their lunch money. It was just kind of, uh, you know, you had some libertarians, you know, that had a hundred bucks worth, you know, people use what, what, how many did they use to buy that pizza? You know, a hundred, you know, whatever it was. A thousand you know. or more, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when, when people were just fooling around with, you know, play money, yeah, I don't really count that. Yet Bitcoin really came on the stage when it ran up to a thousand, right? That was what, in 20... Uh, what was that, 2014 or something yeah. like that? And, and then it shot up. All of a sudden, people, what the hell is this? And, and then, you know, it spent the next few years kind of going back down. It went down to two, 300. And then it really didn't start catching real attention until 2017, when all of a sudden it went up to 20,000. So really, that was the first year where all of a sudden a lot of people, like, looked at it. And that's when people started putting real money in it. I mean, not just, you know, play money, right? That they, they couldn't care less if they lost, right? They were starting to put real money in. People were like taking out loans, using their credit cards, taking out mortgages, and they started, you know, buying Bitcoin. So really it started in a big way in 2017. I, you know, is that a long time in the history of bubbles? I mean, probably not. I, I don't know about every bubble that's existed over the course of time. But I think this one is pretty unique. I mean, I got to give it to the, 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 the big whales that have orchestrated this thing. It's a great marketing campaign. And now they're even trying to sucker in. I mean, they got Michael Saylor uh, and somehow they got um, um, Elon yes. Musk to bite on it. And of course, I've been saying, look, you know, he's in a bubble all on his own. And so maybe he doesn't want to throw pins at bubbles in general. And he's maybe trying to, you know, tie his bubble to the Bitcoin bubble. I don't know, but we'll see uh, how many more uh, CEOs, you know, can be enticed into doing something as crazy as, you know, buying Bitcoin on their balance sheet. I mean, I was listening to, this to uh, Sailor, I mean, talking about, you know, we have to hedge our cash. I mean, you don't hedge something with something riskier than what you're hedging. I mean, your hedge can't be, I mean, you have to take something that has less volatile, I mean, if, if, if you really are worried about the dollar going down, uh, you can certainly own Swiss francs or other currencies uh, if you think the dollar is going to go down. Uh, there's not nearly as much volatility there. But if you think all fiat currencies are going to go down and you're really worried about inflation, well, then you could put gold on your balance sheet if that's what you're worried about. But it makes no sense to buy Bitcoin. I mean, you might as well just buy back your own stock. Uh, is by Bitcoin. I mean, I mean, or the I think Bitcoin is far riskier than any corporation. 